welcome back to the GSP YouTube channel. And if you guys have been watching my previous videos, you probably recognize that this looks a little bit different. Uh, I've done some laptop videos in the past when we're looking at data loggers and stuff, but uh, I'm going to give it a swing uh, in a PowerPoint. That way you don't have to actually look at my face while we're talking about this stuff. And uh, even though my whiteboard pictures are very pretty, uh, I think this is going to be a step up. So let's just go ahead and get started on this. I want to talk about fuels in this video. And I got a lot of guys out there that are running a lot of different fuels. And uh, some of them know why they made that decision and some of them don't. And that's okay because uh, that's what this video is for. And uh, hopefully I can clear up some myths and clear up some confusion about uh, why what one fuel will, will do one thing and um, why you need you know, a bigger fuel pump to run a different fuel, things like that. So let's just go ahead and dive into this and get started. There's three big things when it comes to uh, different fuels and combustion engines. And a um, great place to start is stoichiometric air fuel ratio. Um, that's a, a big thing when you're when you're going between between alcohols and um, and gasoline and it causes a lot of confusion sometimes, especially when we start getting into the different blends that you can get at the pump. Um, stoichiometric air fuel ratio is one of the reasons why flex sensors even exist. Um, octane, I think everybody's heard the word octane, but some of you may not know exactly what octane is. We'll cover that here in just a minute. And lower heating value. Um, that's a good one because a lot of people don't necessarily ever hear about that, um, but it's really that that's related to the, the amount of energy that you get per unit fuel. So we'll uh, we'll cover all of this, and then also going to cover uh, kind of what happens based on those first three things and some other side effects uh, of the fuel. Um, this is more along the lines of you know your inlet temps and uh, everybody knows that E85 will, will take out your fuel lines and um, can cause you know rust in some places inside your engine so we'll cover some of that as well. Uh, let's go ahead and just dive into, uh, into stoichiometry here. So stoichiometry is something that you did in your high school chemistry class if, if you remember that and um, stoichiometry is uh, effectively, in, in the case that we're talking about it here, the stoichiometric air fuel ratio means that we have exactly the correct amount of fuel to burn with the amount of air that we've also consumed into the engine. This means that it's the perfect mixture and there's no excess fuel left over, there's no excess air left over. We have brought in the perfect amount and combusted the perfect amount and um, Honestly, it's something that's basically unachievable if you want to really get down to it. You're, either, you're always going to be on one side or the other because it, you're not going to ever measure the, the perfect amount of air down to the last molecule um, to, to be able to meet that combustion requirement. So one thing that's, you know, you, you got to understand that whenever you target an air fuel ratio is what is, what is your stoichiometric air fuel ratio that you're trying to, to target? Um, for gasoline, it's going to be, uh, you know, a, a lot higher numerically than it is for most other fuels. Some different gasolines have higher than other. It just completely depends on, on what kind of fuel you're going to run. But the thing to understand here is that um, stoichiometry or stoic or um, perfect mixture, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can describe the situation, but uh, ultimately it just comes down to uh, the perfect mix. You don't have any excess of either air or fuel. So let's just kind of look at some some typical air fuel ratios um, for what you're going to run into uh, in the wild here. So pump gas is obviously the most common. Um, this particular stoic value for pump gas is not something that you're going to find in a lot of places anymore, at least in the U.S. And the reason is because everything's got ethanol in it, right? They put as much ethanol in as they possibly can to effectively dilute the fuel because, well, it's cheaper, let's be honest. So you'll actually notice uh, that E10 is 14.13. And the question is, why is that? Why is it not 14.68 like pump gas is? Because it's pretty close to pump gas, right? Well, that's the ethanol content. 
uh, ethanol has a um, much lower stoic value than gasoline does. And I, I went ahead and put E10, E70, and E85 all on this list so that you could kind of see it start to walk down. And uh, let's just see, we could probably predict that, um, you know, 100% ethanol is going to be somewhere around the 90 range uh, in order for you to achieve stoic. So when you're setting up your targets, uh, and, and I'll actually flip over to some software here in just a second and, and show you when you're setting up your targets, it's really important to know what fuel it is that you're actually going to be using. Um, one other thing I want to point out, look at, look at C16 versus Q16. Everybody knows that Q16, especially in boosted applications, um, not so much with the big nitrous stuff, but um, Q16 is the hot ticket for the boost motors these days. And um, you can see a, a big difference in stoichiometric air fuel ratio. And you say, well, why is that? The biggest reason that there is there is uh, Q16 is oxygenated, right? So we're actually bringing on board call it atmosphere if you will, we're bringing on oxygen uh, with the liquid fuel whenever it goes into the engine. And Because of that, that means that now we have more air in the cylinder, so mathematically we've added oxygen to the mix, therefore stoichiometric air fuel ratio actually was going to go down for Q16. It's very similar to C16 except for uh, it's oxygenated. Um, check out methanol. Methanol is, man, you, you, I'm sure if you go digging on some of these uh, big power methanol cars, um, man, they're, they've got huge injectors. I mean, massive injectors. And they have to run uh, belt-driven pumps uh, and off the front of the engine. And um, that's one thing that, that kind of gets rough whenever you're talking about um, your really low numerical stoic values is you're, you're going to deal with having to move an excessive amount of fuel and it's only going to get worse whenever you make more power. Um, nitromethane is obviously the top fuel um, fuel that they use, uh, top fuel in funny car. And nitro has got a stoic value of 1.7 to 1. To put that in perspective, that means that for every 1.7 parts air that goes into the engine, you have to have one part fuel. That means that it, it's it's crazy to think about, but you're almost you're almost it's not even two to one. You're almost putting the same amount of fuel into the engine as you are air, and it's very obvious to think about now. You know when you're looking at the the header pipes off the side of a funny car, they're literally spitting out raw fuel at idle. Whenever they are sitting there and and you know just idling on in a fairly large camshaft that's got a lot of overlap and they have a dead cylinder, it, it just literally spits raw fuel right out the side of it because it's got that much going through it. Those cars use a a seventeen gallon fuel tank. Um, that's a lot of times bigger than what you even have in your street car. Um, they use seventeen gallons of fuel just to do a burnout and make a pass, and they are using a ton of volume in order to to run those cars and a little bit later I don't want to get ahead of myself but I can kind of explain why it is you would want to go to the trouble of using nitromethane so. let's go ahead and talk about octane for just a second I don't want to I don't want to make octane any more than it is um, octane is uh, the description basically of a hydrocarbon chain that is denoted C8H18 and octane is ultimately the resistance to knock. That's what you need to be concerned with. Octane rating, the higher numerically the octane rating is, the more resistance to knock you're going to have. And that's why we run race gas. Um, when you're talking about pump gas, the problem with pump gas, at least in the U.S., is there's too many different concoctions out there. You can't get the same thing twice. Um, you have to detune your engine effectively um, to account for the minimum requirement that they have to meet in order to sell it to you. And 
ultimately what happens is there's really no checks and balances on it. There's really no quality control when it comes to it. They really just want to give you something that's going to go boom and make your car go down the highway. And pump gas is... Um, how do I say this? Well, pump gas can be dangerous. You got to be really careful with pump gas, and there's no real, there's no really such thing as as safe with pump gas. And uh, I don't want to I don't want to put a bad taste in anybody's mouth, but uh, just make good decisions when it comes to your pump gas. Now I kind of alluded to it earlier, but lower heating value, um, lower heating value is effectively the amount of energy that we get based on a quantity of fuel. So I, I, I put the technical definition in here, um, you know, as related to how it's tested and what temperature you're talking about whenever you are running the tests. And um, there's also latent heat of water vaporization that's, you know, not accounted for in the lower heating value. And um, I don't want to get too technical with this because ultimately it's only there to, to really give us, at least in this case, um, some math to understand why we would choose what fuel uh, for a given application. So here's some lower heating values for, for typical fuels. Um, you'll see a trend. Gasoline is a pretty high BTUs per pound, right? Almost 20,000 BTUs per pound. Um, it very quickly uh, is going to drop off. And the thing you have to kind of remember about your lower heating values is we're really going to only use them along with the stoic to do the math. So how do you apply it? Well, if you have gasoline at 20,000 BTUs per pound, and you divide that by your air-fuel ratio, and then you're going to figure out how many BTUs uh, per pound of air you get. So BTUs are, are units of energy, and whenever you have more energy, that means you're applying you know, more work to the piston, right? So check out this math real quick. This is um, kind of interesting. You, you go, okay, well, wh why would I want to run nitromethane if I have to run almost the same amount of nitromethane as I do air. That's a ton of fuel. Why would I ever deal with that? I can't get a fuel pump big enough to run that. Well, the answer is, look at this math. You get over double, over double the amount of energy per unit of air. I said that slowly so that this makes sense you're getting way more energy and the best part is because of the, it's 1.7 to 1 you can run a ton of it you can run a ton of it and yeah okay it's only 5107 right there on, on BTUs per pound it's a fraction you know a quarter of whatever you're gonna get out of gasoline but you can't run that much gasoline to get the amount of energy out so it, it, it's a catch-22 I get that uh, obviously, you're not going to go to your local nitromethane station to fill up your car, so you're not going to run anything on the street on nitromethane. Uh, this isn't Fast and Furious. Um, but anyway, it just kind of puts things into perspective when you go start running the math on all of your different fuels. So I want to go ahead and jump to uh, BSFC. Um, BSFC just simply means how much power do I get for a given amount of fuel. Um, and it's expressed by uh, a mass over unit energy. And really, the, the reason we have BSFC is to rate the efficiency of how we're consuming the fuel. And also, it's really useful, if you know what your BSFC is, to do a little bit of math. And you can pick out you know, what size fuel pump you're going to need. And um, you can pick, pick out your injectors and... Um, just for reference, you know, your, your gasoline stuff, uh, NA, is going to typically uh, be around the, the 0.5 to 0.55 range. Um, if you're getting lower than that, if you're, the, the lower the better. So if you're getting lower than that, then you have a really efficient engine. You're getting a lot of 
uh, your fuel energy is being converted into horsepower. Uh, when you start getting into the boosted stuff, and it, this kind of goes hand in hand with our air fuel ratio, when you're running a higher or lower numerically, uh, richer mixture, how, I'm trying to figure out how to say this the you know every way. Uh, when you're when you're running 11 to one instead of 14.7 on your pump gas, trying to make 14 pounds of boost, etc. When you're running richer that increases your BSFC number. It decreases your efficiency, right? Because we're making the engine richer to do safety things with the engine. We're trying to actually keep the thing alive, not make necessarily peak power with that. Uh, it might make peak power leaned out, but it might only make that peak power once. Um, so we're actually using the, the fuel as a cooling effect uh, on the piston, and, that, and that's the reason that you end up running that rich. Uh, it cools the chamber, it cools the piston. Um, that's that's the whole point behind that. So that's going to decrease your efficiency, increase your BSFC number. Um, running a fuel that requires you to run a much lower stoic value, like ethanol E85, uh, for instance, if you're running E85, typical BSFC numbers are going to be in the 0 0.8, 0 0.9 range. Um, you know, obviously, the the lower you go in stoic value, the higher your BSFC number is going to be because, quite frankly, you just have to use that much more fuel uh, by volume because that's what we're that's what we're using here. Not by volume, sorry, actually mass. We're actually using the mass of the fuel um, to uh, to make these numbers work out. So. Uh, that's how we use BSFC. Uh, I kind of talked about it, why we run a richer mixture um, whenever you're looking at your, your your boosted applications with pump gas, your, your boosted applications with the 85, but really any, any boosted application in general, uh, we've learned over the years, is going to be safer when it's richer. Um, and that is due to really this effect right here. Um, Latent heat of vaporization refers to the amount of energy that is, call it, consumed in the process of vaporizing uh, liquid fuel. And it's the reason that carburetors, uh, you know, cause such a, a drastic um, inlet temperature drop. It's the reason that engines, that the higher you put the injector uh, in the runner, ends up making a little more power. Um, it's also dependent upon what the fuel actually is. Uh, a lot of the way that we solved, you know, detonation and knock in the early 2000s with is methanol injection, and, and they're still around today. Um, that's a different video altogether. But long story short, methanol is uh, extremely good at cooling your air your air inlet uh, temperatures, and uh, also good for you know keeping pistons cool and keeping rings cool and uh, overall you make more power because the air density is uh, obviously increased whenever you cool air uh, it becomes more closely packed together which means that for the same volume you actually get more air molecules and uh, more air means more fuel more fuel means more power and uh, that's, that's the driving factor behind making more power. Um, it also is very good in situations where we need to you know, reduce air inlet temps. Um, so that's, that's ultimately the two places where you're going to be worried about this. I uh, kind of alluded to it earlier, but methanol is really bad about it. Ethanol is pretty bad about it. Um, Part of that cooling effect is that at idle, whenever you're not really making a lot of heat, uh, your engine is going to probably be prone to building condensation. Uh, it's building just enough heat that it's going to want to, to, you know, cover over in, in water out of the air. And, you know, everybody kind of likes to, to joke about how they made a dyno pole with their methanol car and, um, you know, it's got water droplets beating up on the on the intake. Um, that's great. It's fantastic for your air inlet temps. It's fantastic for your pistons. It's not fantastic for your oil. 
um, what happens is you run the car and you get it pretty hot and then you sit there and idle for a little while and it kind of cools off to just that perfect temperature that it just pulls all the moisture out of the air and do that six or eight times and now you have uh, uh, oil that's you know chocolate milk and you think you got a blown head gasket whenever in fact uh, you don't it's just a matter of all the condensation um, that's less of an issue with E85, but you will see it some. And uh, there's also, you know, the issue of, of blow-by. Whenever you're running these fuels that, yeah, they have great uh, latent heat vaporization uh, effects, but they, uh, they also require, uh, kind of coincidentally, a, a very rich uh, mixture, and they end up, also causing you to have to run a really low stoic value that then means that you're running a ton of fuel volume and because of that a lot of times you can get fuel to leak past your rings and then the fuel ends up into the, uh, the engine oil as well and causes you all sorts of problems um, everybody knows too that E85 is really hard on some of our older styles of rubber um, in the future here we've we've come up with different alcohol impervious rubbers and um, everything's Teflon lined now and that's great and it's something that you should really be cognizant of if you do decide to go to E85 you need to buy PTFE lined uh, or Viton um, grades of fuel line so that your your fuel doesn't literally like evaporate through the line um, it's crazy to think about, but that's what it does, and it also can cause it to break down and crack, and um, not something that's very good for, for something that's flammable, let's put it that way. In conclusion, you just got to choose the fuel that's right for you. Um, you got to set your goals first. That's always the first step to doing anything with a car, and when you're picking a build, whenever you're setting up an engine, whenever you're trying to figure out what on earth you're even going to do with this thing. First thing you got to do is, is pick a goal, pick a, pick a power number even. Um, set a track time you want to run. And ultimately when you, what you're doing when you set a track time that you want to run is you're, you're picking a power number because you got to figure out what the car weighs and make a reasonable assumption of how much power you think you're going to need in order to run that time. And uh, you just got to you got to choose based on power what fuel makes the most sense based on availability and cost I can't go buy nitromethane um, from a local store um, it would be if I could if I bought barrels and brought them home it would be unbelievably cost prohibitive um, to drive that down the road you would never run nitro on the street I think it's something ridiculous like thousands of dollars for a 55 gallon drum of nitro um, you wouldn't be able to get you know to the end of the block and back without spending a couple hundred dollars. Um, E85 has a downside to it because it has a stoic value of 9.81. You have to run 33%, 35%, something like that more fuel by volume. So unless the fuel itself is actually that much cheaper by 30-something percent, um, you're spending more money to run E85. Now, is it race gas that you can get at the pump? Yeah, sort of. Um, it makes sense in a, in a case where you need to uh, increase your octane content because you want to run enough boost that you potentially would be into a situation that would cause knock. Um, we can go back to the previous video that I did and, and understand that um, that knock line is raised uh, whenever you have a higher octane. Um, the main thing that I want you guys to get out of this video is understand exactly how your fuel works so that you know how to maintain your car and you know how to uh, make decisions in your tune that will ultimately lead to success and uh, not, not hurt any parts. And I'm going to go ahead right now and click over to some software so bear with me just a second and this is going to be tricky actually 
let's go over to some Terminator X software. All right. When you're setting this up, this is a Terminator X setup. It's a canned Holly tune. You'll see gasoline right here. And what that does is it sets the internal stoic value to 14.7. And you need to know that because Holly forces us to tune in AFR and not Lambda. Whenever you go and set your target air fuel ratios, you'll see that you're, we're targeting 14.7 here. I wish that we could run Lambda, and the reason that I say that is because Lambda means at Lambda 1, 1 1.00, that means that that's the perfect stoic mix. Anything less than 1 means we're rich. Anything above 1 means that we're lean. And so, ultimately, we're always targeting the same Lambda values. The oxygen sensor that's in your header tube it doesn't know the difference between what fuel you're running. All it knows is it's rich or it's lean and how much it's rich or lean. And uh, that ultimately is what Lambda is. So if I know that I'm going to target a, a, a Lambda of 0.75, it doesn't matter what fuel I'm running. If I want to, in some cases, um, guys that have flex, a lot of times I will tune in gas scale even though they're running flex, that way we can add the timing to it and we can add the fuel to it rather than the other way around where we have to take fuel out. Um, typically you would, you know, in some applications want to take fuel out, but I like to do it that way because if the flex sensor ever fails, it's going to default to the safer timing and um, that's, that's always where I want to be. You know, we want to, timing is so important. We've got the uh, oxygen sensor in there to save us on, on the fueling. Um, but if we miss on timing, it's really easy to hurt parts that way. And so uh, we just want to be cognizant of that. Um, if I go in here and change this fuel type to E85, I have to go back in here to this target air fuel ratio and reduce these values. It's very important that we bring these things down. And the reason is because these calculations right here affect the calculations that go into our base fuel table if we're using volumetric efficiency in order to deliver the right amount of fuel. If you are using your actual fuel flow, it's also really important to take this table and increase it by the proper amount. Um, that way you, you have the, the correct fuel flow uh, to start with. So I don't want to make this video any longer than it needs to be. You just need to know up front uh, what your stoic value is so that you can properly set up this tune. E85, because of that stoic value, requires you to run 35% more fuel everywhere. That means that this table here needs to be increased by 35%. Your target air fuel ratio needs to come down by approximately 35%. And your startup enrichment needs to increase 35%. Your acceleration enrichment, this is going to have to increase by about 35%. Um, it's just the nature of the beast, and whenever you change this little checkbox right here, it doesn't change anything except for the assumed stoic value that you're going to have. One last thing to point out. If you're running E85 in the fuel type, but you're only getting actually E60, and you don't have any kind of advanced table or flex sensor or anything like that to set that off, it's going to run okay. You're just going to see some correction. It's not a huge deal, but what a lot of times will help if you're fighting the thing and it's you can't seem to get your, your corrections right, if you will take this table whenever this happens and just, just lean it out a little bit, Instead of being 9.8, let let's let's run the E70 stoic value. It's kind of splitting the difference, yes. You want to make sure that you're still safe up top, absolutely. 
Uh, but you'll find that a lot of times this will end up idling a lot better um, just because it's not targeting a number that is, you know, shoot, 10, 15% off when it gets down to it. I think I'm going to wrap it up right there, guys, but I really appreciate you hanging with me if you made it this far. Uh, leave me some comments. Leave me some questions. Be sure to go check out uh, my Mac Life's YouTube channel. I'm going to leave a, a link to uh, to his channel in the description below. We just started that up. And um, I'm going to go ahead and tease. If you guys sat through the whole way through this, I'm going to go ahead and, and give you the inside scoop. Uh, I just recently went ahead and bought a new Terminator X system, uh, brand new in the box. And I'm going to go through and completely cover every last aspect that I can think of um, using that that new kit um, we'll do an unboxing we'll go through the entire wiring harness I'll show you how to check all of your pins to make sure that they're the correct thing um, we'll go into how to piggyback install into a car setting up the handheld first starts what you should look for the list goes on um, I'm really excited about that uh, not only because I really want to put a Holly on my Corvette anyway, um, but also to, uh, for the state of the channel, I, I think it's going to make for some really good content and uh, definitely going to make for some good back-to-back uh, -back dyno tests. So I'm going to end it there. If you have any questions, hit me up. Otherwise, I will see you guys next time.